a lecture by Professor Sandeep Verma from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. He will give two talks and the first talk is today on the topic, some results of Borel and Harish Chandra. Introduction to some results of Borel and Harish Chandra. So now I request uh, Professor Verma to start the talk. Thank you, Professor Katre. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so let's uh, uh, begin. Uh, so at the very beginning, let me share this uh, uh, list of uh, references that one could uh, use. So all of these are uh, very nice references. So I'll uh, give uh, these slides later. So uh, you can look at these and then look up these references. Okay, so except for the book, everything else is available online. And the book is, of course, a book. Um, okay, so let's uh, look at uh, the action, usual action of SL2 of R on the upper half plane by Mobius transformations. A matrix A, B, C, D acts on the element Z in the upper half plane by sending it to AZ plus B by CZ plus D. Okay. Now, it is a very easy and elementary check that this action is simply is actually transitive okay so the uh, there is only one orbit for this action uh, so it identifies upper half plane with sl2 of r modulo the stabilizer of any point you can take that point to be i and then the stabilizer can be checked to be so2 of r so upper half plane gets identified with sl2 of r divided by modulo so2 of r which is contained of course in gl2 of r modulo o2 of r uh, so, since uh, GL2 of R acts transitively on the space of positive definite quadratic forms on R2 and the stabilizer is O2 of R, GL2 of R mod O2 of R is the space of all positive definite quadratic forms on R2 and the upper half plane or SL2 of R mod SO2 of R can be viewed as a subspace of that space. Okay. So, moreover, SL2 of R and SO2 of R both have unimodular Haar meshes. That is, they have left Haar measures, which are also right Haar measures. And because both are unimodular, it is a basic theorem that uh, SL2 of R modulo SO2 of R, that is any unimodular group modulo a closed subgroup, has an invariant quotient measure. Okay, So the measure on SL2 of R mod SO2 of R, or equivalently H, is invariant under the SL2 action. Okay. So what is this measure on upper half plane? Up to a constant, this is given by dx dy by y square which is also the natural measure thrown out by the uh, hyperbolic Riemannian structure on the upper half plane. Okay, So um, uh, now inside SL2 of R, which acts transitively on H, we have this subgroup called SL2 of Z. Okay, So 2 by 2 matrices with uh, entries in Z and determinant 1. So we are actually interested in the quotient of upper half plane by the action of SL2 of Z, which we'll be denoting by gamma for now. Okay, so this action is a nice kind of action. It is what is known as a properly discontinuous action. And therefore, the quotient H mod gamma is a nice manifold. And you can write it as SL2 of R, right modulo SO2 R, left modulo gamma. Okay, uh, it gets a measure from H because H to H mod gamma is locally a homeomorphism. Okay, so while H identified with some space of quadratic forms, H mod gamma identifies with quadratic forms up to uh, into integral equivalence, some space of quadratic forms up to integral equivalence. And in Gauss, Gauss had uh, uh, observed that all these quadratic forms can be realized by elements in the upper half plane, which belongs to a particular region. Uh, and he called them formas reductas, which according to Nies Droy's thesis, I don't know how to pronounce that name, is uh, the origin of the subject reduction theory. Okay. So kind of what are quadratic forms up to integral, uh, certain positive definite quadratic forms up to integral equivalence. Okay, so uh, any questions so far? Okay, so let us uh, look at the action of, remember gamma means SL2 of Z, it is acting by uh, Mobius transformations on the upper half plane. Okay, so it so turns out that one has what is known as a fundamental domain. Okay, so if you look at this, uh, so this picture, whatever is above the x-axis is supposed to be the upper half plane. And inside that picture is a gray shaded region. Okay, so any point in the upper half plane can be acted on by an element of SL2 of Z and brought into that gray shaded region. 
and that is why it is known as a fundamental domain okay and two different elements in that gray shaded region except possibly in the boundary are not conjugate to each other under gamma and even in boundary there are some restrictions on when two elements can be conjugate under gamma okay so this gray shaded region is roughly a set of representatives for the orbits of gamma on h okay so there is such a nice set of orbits okay and what is volume of the quotient of h mod gamma remember it had an sl2 of uh, z invariant measure so what is that uh, volume if you appropriately normalize it it is also the volume of the gray region and you can compute it okay so let's not bother with the details of the computation you can check that this volume is exactly pi over 3 which is less than infinity okay in other words this volume is uh, less uh, less is uh, a nice number less than infinity and similarly in sl2 of r you can consider the subgroup sl2 of z which is gamma it's a discrete subgroup that quotient also has a volume which is invariant under sl2 of r and for a good uh, notion for a good notion of uh, a good normalization of measures on sl2 of r you can check that this volume is actually pi square over 6 which is zeta of 2 less than infinity so the whole thing is something with quite a bit of number theoretic significance what is this uh, object down gamma mod sl2 r uh, so it is uh, so sl2 of r is a locally compact group and gamma is a closed subgroup okay okay this is the quotient okay quotient is it's not any nice geometric object right uh it is in some sense nice because uh, you know see sl2 of r itself is like upper half plane together with so2 of r so this is something closely related to h mod gamma okay okay but not a manifold it is a manifold okay because gamma is a discrete subgroup of sl2 of r it's a manifold okay okay, okay so it's the volume of that manifold under the quotient measure from sl2 of r Any other questions? Yes, H mod gamma manifold uh, uh, gamma uh, does not act freely, right? Uh, gamma has some stabilizers, like you know this minus one over two root three over two etc. Stabilizers. Nevertheless, H mod gamma is a nice uh, manifold. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Any other question? Uh, anyway, we can discuss later. But H mod gamma is not a manifold; it is a RB fold, but I'm no, it is. Uh, it has it has a Riemann Riemann surface structure. It is a manifold, I think. So yeah. Uh. Uh. Okay. So anyway, let us uh, let's uh, discuss that. So at that point, you have to take the coordinate as uh, z z z square or z cube or something like that. You know, that's the uh, one difference you will have to do. But anyway, let's uh, let's move ahead. Yeah. So let me uh, also make. A remark that you know this structure of uh, like you know this structure might look quite ugly and for those who are not very familiar with this i wanted to make a few comments on why this structure although it looks ugly it is actually not ugly okay it only looks uh, revolting because we are viewing it uh, uh, with the euclidean distance on it okay uh, so uh, the euclidean distance does not behave well with respect to the action of sl2 of r but there is another notion of another metric on this same space which behaves well with respect to the uh, action of SL2 of R. It is what is called the hyperbolic metric, dx square plus dy square by y square. And what it does is regions which are uh, with high y coordinate, the distances are uh, like, you know, these distances are exaggerated in the picture. Whereas regions near the x axis, the picture actually compresses the uh, uh, distances giving the impression that everything is actually crowding around the x-axis. Okay, actually, there is no such crowding around. Uh, in fact, all these uh, regions that you see over here look similar to each other if we actually use the hyperbolic distance. Okay. Uh, now, uh, 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 now, the thing is, uh, you know, you might also feel that this, this is actually a very ugly mixture of lines and circles or arcs, but in the hyperbolic sense, these are all actually lines, you know, they are all geodesics. So each region is actually a triangle with two vertices in the upper half plane and one vertex at infinity or on the x-axis. Okay. So these are actually triangles which form a nice surface, nice shape. So in the disk model, this picture looks slightly less ugly and that picture is what is given over here. Okay. So these pictures are very nice and uh, 
the like you know SL two of a, Z acts on these tiling, so it is not very surprising that these have nice number theoretic properties. Uh, so uh, one would like to study functions on these. One would like to study their cohomology and so on. And for that, uh, one would uh, actually need to know some basic questions like you know, is the quotient compact? Does the quotient have finite measure? Okay, after that, one can do more sophisticated analysis. And what Borel and Harishchandra do is, they do this for more general G mod gamma, okay, for higher rank G mod gamma. Now, this picture itself might look quite intimidating, but the good thing about higher dimension is that we don't have to visualize. We can use some intuition from this lower dimensional situation and structure theory for linear algebraic groups. And Borel and Harishchandra develop a very nice theory to understand this setting, okay? So, any questions? Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, so this is again a picture of the fundamental domain. Okay, so this H mod gamma is not compact because if you look at this gray region, as Y goes to infinity, it is not closing up. Okay. So one way to think of it is that for large, as long as you have two points, X plus I Y and X prime plus I Y prime with large Y coordinate, if they are conjugated or gamma, then you can actually show that they have the same y coordinate. Okay, they are stable. Uh, they are conjugate to each other under some upper triangular matrix. Okay, so uh, that one can use to show that uh, you know the H mod gamma is actually not compact. But we would like to do this in greater generality. Okay, so uh, using that SL two of R uh, H mod gamma is not compact. Since SL two of R mod gamma surjects onto it, it follows that SL two of R mod gamma is not compact either. Okay. So we would like to study more groups, general groups G of R, uh, subgroups gamma in G of R, we generalize H SL2 of Z and ask the question of when are these quotients compact and when are these quotients of finite volume. Okay. So let me give some bits from history. First of all, Hermit in 1853, 1850 uh, uh, proved some inequalities and then generalized the whole thing to SLM instead of SL2. And then Minkowski, when he developed the geometry of numbers around 1900, got a better fundamental domain, still not a perfect one, and showed that the volume is finite. And Siegel did uh, the same thing for more general groups, O of PQ. Uh, okay, with respect to the analog of SON in this case is actually O of P mod O of Q, which is a compact group. And uh, the these subgroups O of PQ of Z need a bit more care to define. I haven't defined them yet. Okay, so define, depending on how these are defined, these quotients may or may not be compact, but still they have a finite volume. Okay, and there are some further aspects. Siegel computed that SLM of R mod SLM of Z has a nice volume. Remember for M equals two, the volume was just zeta of two, which was pi square over six. But for more general M, it's actually zeta of two times up to zeta of M. But this we'll not discuss. So this needs Roy's thesis has some history. Okay. Uh, hello. Yeah. Uh, so in the very first place, uh, would it be the SO n would be replaced by SO m because I mean the isotropic of this uh, double coset should be SO m right instead of the n. Sorry, sorry. Uh, where in which equation? Uh, in the very first uh, second double line. Coset. Second line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that SO n had to be SO m. That's a typo. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, SLM mod SOM. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, That was a typo. Any other questions or uh, any other uh, corrections, comments? Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, so the, here are some of the topics that we plan to discuss. Let G be a semi simple or reductive group over Q. Okay, for SLM, we had a very nice subgroup, gamma, which was SLM of Z. Okay. What for a general group G, what are the corresponding groups, subgroups, gamma that we should consider? Okay. What can be thought of as G of Z? What does G of Z even mean in this case? Okay. So these are going to be what are called congruent subgroups and arithmetic subgroups. Today I may not get time to discuss them, but hopefully next time. And the question is for G of R mod gamma, uh, once we define such gamma, when is it compact and when is it of finite volume? Okay. And once we discuss this, depending on whether time permits, we'll discuss some applications of uh, these results. Okay, so these are results of Borel and Harishchandra. Since then, different proofs uh, have been given 
like for instance by godma following mostu and tamogawa so today we'll exclusively focus on slm of r modulo slm of z okay uh, any other question okay let me move on okay so let us start by looking at sl2 of r mod sl2 of z its non compactness we noticed using upper half plane modulo sl2 of z okay now how can you describe so you see remember that y coordinate on the upper half plane was the culprit behind h mod sl2 of z being non compact okay how can you understand that y coordinate group theoretically once you understand that y coordinate group theoretically then you can possibly hope to generalize whatever we observe for sl2 onto sl m okay so let us interpret that so first of all there is something called the ibasawa decomposition for sl2 of r it says that if you define the you have certain subgroups n a and k of sl2 such that the multiplication map from n cross a cross a to sl2 is a diffeomorphism okay it is not an isomorphism of groups but at the level of manifolds it's a smooth map whose inverse is also which has a smooth inverse okay so what is n here n of r is the subgroup of upper triangular matrices a of r is the group, subgroup of diagonal matrices with positive entries okay so we are not including minus 1 minus 1 and k is just so2 of r okay so one uh, hint at proving ibasawa decomposition is that whenever k belongs to so2 of r if you multiply these three matrices 1x01 root y00 root y inverse and uh, any element of so2 of r if you act by that on the element i in the upper half plane what you get is just x plus i y okay so this is an easy matrix multiplication that you can check okay once you check that uh, it is easy to check that uh, you know uh, this ibasawa decomposition is a diffeomorphism anyway i'll give a more general proof for glm of r later okay this any element g of sl2 of r if you write, write it as n times diagonal a is 0 0 a inverse times k okay then a1 by a2 that is a1 is a and a2 is a inverse which is a squared is what captures y because what is this uh, root y divided by root y inverse or root y whole square that is the same as y right so what you see as y on the upper half plane when you act on i is actually covered uh, by the a component of the ibasawa uh, decomposition okay any questions so the ibasawa decomposition tells us how to generalize the y coordinate to sl m of r okay so now let me state the ibasawa decomposition for glm of r so the multiplication map still gives us a decomposition of the very same form except that this time n is the same as before upper triangular m cross m real matrices with ones on the diagonal a of r not is still the diagonal matrices with positive entries on the diagonal okay and k is just om of r earlier it was som now it is om okay so this is for glm if we wanted to discuss slm we have to just add a determinant condition anywhere everywhere which is automatically satisfied for n for n you will uh, a, for a you will have to impose that a1 times up to am is 1 for k you will have to replace om by som okay so the analog of y coordinate or height is going to be like this take an element g of glm of r use the ibasawa decomposition to write uh, so it's a part as a diagonal matrix matrix a1 a2 up to am and if you compute a1 by a2 a2 by a3 up to am minus 1 by am that is going to be an analog of the y coordinate in the upper half plane okay so we are that is going to capture how non compact glm of r or mod glm of z or slm of r mod slm of z is any questions okay let me go ahead okay so before proving the ibasawa decomposition let us prepare for its proof so this proof is actually just group theory and not number theory but still it is going to be useful for us so let's do it okay so the setting is where w over r w is a real vector space of dimension m and we are interested in the set of all ordered bases of w okay so set of all m tuples w1 w2 up to wm 
so that these form a basis for W. Okay. Why are we interested in this uh, set? The point is that the group that we are interested in acts simply transitively on it. We can study our group and its decomposition by studying our actions on this set of ordered basis of W. Okay. So there are two very similar looking groups which act on it. First, GLR of W acts on this space. Secondly, GLM of R also acts on this space. Okay, I'm going to describe how they are. Since W is of dimension M, GLR of W is isomorphic to GLM of R, but not canonically. Okay, if you choose a basis of W, that choice of a basis gives you an isomorphism between these two groups. So therefore, these two actions are also going to be different. The action of GLR of W is actually by some sort of diagonal action. G takes W1 up to WM to GW1 up to GWM. Okay. But this is not the action that we are going to be interested in. We are going to be interested in the action of GLM of R on the set of W1 up to WM. So that's going to be by matrix multiplication. Okay. So you will view W1 up to WM as a column vector, which will be denoted W up to WM transpose that little T on the left stands for transpose. And then we'll use matrix multiplication to make GLM of R act on it. Okay. So A, B, C, D acting on W1, W2 is going to be A, W1 plus B, W2, C, W1 plus D, W2. Okay. So it needs to be kept in mind that it's the second action that we are going to use. Although the first action might be more what is what we are used to. Any questions? So please remember this action. Okay. So in the next page, we are going to use the action of GLM of R to prove the Iwasawa decomposition for GLM of R and not GLR of W. Okay. So these actions, so why does this action help us study GLM of R? Because GLM of R acts simply transitively on the set of all these ordered bases. So if we can study ordered bases, we can study GLM of R. Okay. So, so for instance, in GLM of R, there are these diagonal matrices, right? Diag of A1, A2 up to AM. How does that act on the space of ordered matrices, ordered uh, bases? It simply multiplies W1 by A1, W2 by A2 up to WM by AM. Okay. So it simply scales the basis. Okay. How does K, which is OM of R act on the basis? Okay. So choose a, choose uh, any inner product and choose any orthonormal basis for that inner product. And then those elements of GLM of R, which takes that orthonormal basis to another orthonormal basis is an element of uh, K, which is OM of R. Okay. So similarly, you can describe the action of N also. So we can study different subgroups of GLM of R in terms of these bases. And we are going to use this in the next slide to prove Ibasawa decomposition for GLM of R. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So here is an idea of the proof. Okay, so by proof, I mean only like, you know, sketch of the proof. So let W with this inner product, okay, that angle bracket thing is an inner product, be an M, M dimensional vector space with an inner product. And let E1, E2 up to EM be an orthonormal basis for that space. So we already have one ordered basis for the space and K is the associated orthogonal group. Actually, this is, uh, this is not, I wanted to write. I should have said that K was actually ON of R, OM of R, okay. So that was, that's a small typo. A of R naught is the set of diagonal matrices as in the Ibasawa decomposition. N of R is the set of all upper triangular matrices, subgroup of upper triangular matrices, again, as in the Ibasawa decomposition. Okay. Now, what are we going to do? Given an element G in GLM of R, remember, we want to get a decomposition G equal to N, A, K. Okay. Each of G, N, A, and K, will be described based on how they act on basis. We already have one basis E1, E2 up to EM that is going to relate G to one of our bases and to describe N, A and K, we'll need to define other bases. Okay. So let me, before going through the slide, let me tell you what we are going to do in the slide. Okay. We want to decompose a matrix into other matrices using operations on basis, right? What is one operation on basis that we know? We know what is known as the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization. The Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization starts with some basis of the of a vector space with an inner product, 
and produces first produces it uh, an orthogonal basis and then produces an ortho normal basis okay so we are if we just translate that grand schmidt to group theory using this action of glmfr what comes out is pre precisely the ibasawa decomposition okay so the first basis wm up to w1 i am writing it in the reverse order because of this weird action that we are using is simply obtained by acting by g on the standard basis even e2 up to em by the for the same matrix multiplication action okay so wm up to w1 encodes g we want other bases which will encode n a and k okay so how are w1 up to wm and u1 up to um going to be defined w1 bar up to wm bar is precisely the gram schmidt orthogonalization of w1 up to wm okay what does that mean wi bar is going to be the projection of wi onto the perpendicular with respect to our inner product of the span of w1 up to di wi minus 1 okay so you take wi and project to the orthogonal of the previous guys because we want an orthogonal basis that is what is known as the gram schmidt orthogonalization the resulting basis is w1 bar up to wm bar and then what do you do that is only an orthogonal basis right it is not ortho normal so you scale it by their inverse of the length to get an ortho normal basis okay so that is u1 u2 up to um okay so the strategy of the proof is going to be as follows already i defined wm up to w1 so that g takes em up to e1 to wm up to w1 okay we are going to define k so that it will take em up to e1 to um up to u1 we are going to define a so that it will take um up to u1 to wm bar up to w1 bar and we'll define n so that it will take wm bar up to w1 bar to wm up to w1 okay so if you look at this picture both n a k is there something wrong can everyone hear me yeah yeah we can okay, hear you thank you i i heard some strange uh, messages okay so both g as well as n a k are going to take e m up to e1 to w m up to w1 so g will be n a k that's the idea okay so why does there exist such a k well it's something that i mentioned in the previous slide because e1 up to e m and u m up to u1 up to u m are both ortho normal bases so whatever takes one to the other has to be an element of o n of r okay so k was really o n of r why does there exist an a such that it takes wm bar up to w1 bar to um up to u1 because u1 up to um was simply obtained by scaling w1 bar up to wm bar okay scaling is what diagonal matrices do okay and why does there exist an n so that it takes w1 bar up to w wm bar up to w1 bar to wm up to w1 because that is the nature of the gram schmidt orthogonalization process w1 was simply W one bar plus W one bar. Okay, W one and W one bar are actually are actually the same in Gram Schmidt orthogonalization. W two bar is obtained by W two is W two bar plus some multiple of W one bar. W three is W three bar plus some linear combination of W one bar and W two bars and so on. So if you transcribe that into matrices, it will follow that whatever takes W one bar up to W one bar to uh, W one bar up to W one bar to W one up to W one is precisely an element of is an upper triangular matrix okay so the weird ordering that i took about m to 1 etc has to do with my wanting upper triangular rather than lower triangular matrices okay so this is the proof of the ivasawa decomposition any questions okay uh, so all that we did is we just looked at gram schmidt orthogonalization and that then translated into group theory using the simple transitive action okay so this is just a summary in the ivasawa decomposition n simply captures the gram schmidt orthogonalization from w1 up to wm to w1 bar up to wm bar okay and what does a capture a simply capture the captures the the uh, the length of the wi bar with respect to the inner product that means how far were the orthogonal bases w1 bar up to wm bar far how far removed was it from being ortho normal okay so a is simply uh, 
the length of wm length of wm minus 1 up to length of w1 okay okay so now let us discuss what we are going to generalize okay so earlier i had a gray region right it was some region between these two vertical lines and which lie above the unit circle okay that was the fundamental domain but generalizing such a precise fundamental domain to higher rank semi simple or reductive groups is actually going to be difficult so we are going to only generalize a coarse approximation to that same domain okay so namely we add a little bit more to that domain and make it much simpler namely set of all elements in the upper half plane whose x coordinate lies between minus half and half and where the y coordinate is at least root 3 over 2 okay so that is this uh, trough like region that is over there which is slightly larger than the usual fundamental domain so that we will generalize to more general semi simple or reductive groups or at least we will just sketch and that will be although it is coarse it will approximate a fundamental domain well enough that we will be able to study many things about groups okay so recall this decomposition that we used in the upper half plane okay so the corresponding fundamental domain in sl2 of r mod sl2 of z is going to be like this rough fundamental domain it will be set of all elements with the following sort of ibasawa decomposition okay so the n part which is 1 x 0 1 that x should have because it is the x coordinate it should have absolute value at most 1 half as you see in the picture what about a a1 over a2 is the y coordinate remember root y divided by root y inverse and since y had to be at least root 3 over 2 we wanted a1 a over a2 should to be at least root 3 over 2 okay and k can be anything you want okay so our fundamental domain for uh, sl2 of r mod sl2 of z that is it's going to be a subset of sl2 of r it will be those elements in sl2 of r g which have a nivasawa decomposition with some restriction on n reflecting conditions on the x coordinate and then with some other reflection uh, conditions on the diagonal matrices which reflects some condition on the y coordinate okay any questions on this so next page we are going to start with this process for slm of r okay so look at this picture and try to write down the obvious generalization for this uh, what you get is going to be the rough or coarse fundamental domain for slm of r mod slm of z okay so in the previous slide yeah. i did not understand how we got the uh, can you just walk us through again uh, how you got the coarse fundamental domain so uh, what was the fundamental domain itself the fundamental domain was the region between these two vertical lines right and right. a uh, unit circle right yeah so we are enlarging it slightly to simplify it so not only you have that region but you are actually including everything with y coordinate at least root 3 over 2 between those two lines okay okay we are just deciding to do that it's actually larger but it's simpler okay that's all okay and uh, this decision to make it large is this not any canonical decision right you made it uh... it generally is better to reductive groups because oh, okay. see look at the look at the bottom part of this page right mm -hmm. the bottom part of this page tells you that it can be described very simply in terms of ibasawa decomposition oh okay it does not have such a nice description okay i see i see okay but coarse fundamental domain may not have all the information as the usual fundamental domain right yeah but usual fundamental domain is just too difficult for more general groups okay any other question okay uh okay so we are interested in slm of r mod slm of z for later use okay though we are not going to use this now let me mention that this is going to be thought of as space of lattices l contained in rm every lattice in rm sorry it was actually again rm not rn okay so that's again a typo all lattices which have a co volume of 1 okay what is a co volume of a lattice go take rn modulo lattice give it the measure from rn rm and that measure should be equal to 1 okay so why is this equal because you see you have the standard lattice zm inside rm right 
So if you make SLM of R mod SLM of, SLM of R act on it by taking G2, G inverse times ZM, the stabilizer of ZM is actually SLM of Z, Z on the left. Okay. And you can check that SLM of R acts transitively on the space of all these lattices, unimodular lattices. And since the st stabilizer is SLM of Z, SLM R mod SLM Z identifies with the space of unimodular lattices in RM, that is co-volume one. Okay. So we wanted to, we want to lift, we want to get a subset of SLM of R, which captures all the cosets modulo SLM of Z. Okay. So let G belong to SLM of R. The key lemma is that you can always see the earlier lemma said that if you took an element of the upper half plane, you can act on it by SL2 of Z and get it to somewhere within the fundamental domain. Similarly, if you start with an arbitrary element of SLM of R, you can pick up an element of SLM of Z such that gamma G has a particular form which generalizes the earlier coarse fundamental domain. Okay. Namely, if you write gamma G as NAK with uh, A equals diagonal, diagonal A1, A2 up to AM, then the following two things which generalize the earlier uh, uh, properties are satisfied. Namely, a1 A2 up to AM should satisfy that A1 over A2 up to AM minus 1 over AM. All these should be at least root 3 over 2. And moreover, N is going to be some upper triangular matrix. All its upper triangular matrix should have uh, uh, entries, strictly upper triangular matrices. Uh, sorry, all its strictly upper triangular entries should have absolute value at most one half. So this is like absolute value of X was less than or equal to one half. Okay. So G in SLM of R generalizes a point in the upper half plane in some sense. And we have got conditions which generalize the Y coordinate being at least root three over two and the X coordinate being at most half in absolute value. Okay. So now the point is, again, this is a statement about matrices. If you started with Iwasawa decomposition at the level of matrices, it would have been difficult to prove it. And we had to kind of reinterpret it in terms of uh, basis and uh, inner forms and all the inner products and all that to get the Iwasawa decomposition. Similarly, we are going to be able to, we are going to have to interpret this lemma in terms of lattices and inner products and so on. So that interpretation I'm going to write now. Okay. So we are going to state it slightly more generally. Let A be any real number, which is at most root three over two. And let B, any, B be any real number, which is at least half. Okay. So this root three over two and half we have already seen in the lemma. Okay. Given any L lattice L inside a vector space W with an inner product, L has a very special kind of basis. Okay. I'm going to define what this AB reduced this. Okay. So let me repeat. You are given a vector space W with an inner product, which is M dimensional. Any lattice inside that vector space. Okay. So that is any copy of Z to the M inside that vector space has a very particular kind of basis W1 up to WM, which we are going to call AB reduced. Okay. What is that? Namely, first form the Gram Smith orthogonalization of W1 up to WM. Okay. Namely, W1 bar up to WM bar. Okay. Remember, this is consistent with our earlier notation. W1 up to WM is a basis. W1 bar up to WM bar is the Gram Smith orthogonalization. Then the lengths of the successive vectors in the orthogonal basis, W bar i plus 1 mod W bar i is going to be at least root 3 over 2. Secondly, the way you go from your basis to the orthogonal basis, okay, the matrix that takes you from the W i to the W bar i or the other way around has its uh, off diagonal entries at most half or B. Okay. So uh, this is a statement and I have not explained to you why the statement is equivalent to the key lemma, though it is not surprising, right? When we discuss the proof of the Ibasawa decomposition, the ratios of the lengths of vectors was actually the diagonal part and the transition from the orthogonal basis to the original basis, which was not orthogonal was the end part of the Ibasawa decomposition. Okay. So it's reasonable that these two should be related, but we'll come to that again. Okay. So let me, so this, so please spend a little bit of time and read the lemma in the latter half of the page. 
that is the translation okay so any lattice in an inner product base space has a basis which satisfies a particular property okay so let me explain this property slightly more because it takes some time to absorb you see what is the nicest kind of lattice it would have been nice if the lattice had an orthonormal basis right if you had an orthonormal basis w1 up to wm but that is not true and what this is saying is that you can still choose a basis which is actually kind of close to being orthogonal orthonormal okay the second condition is saying that if you do gram schmidt orthogonalization then you will not have to change the wi too much to get the wi bar okay you will only need to change by matrices whose entries have half other than the identity uh, like you know uh, the diagonal entries the first entry is telling you that the, the first condition is telling you that the resulting orthogonal basis is kind of close to being an orthonormal basis in the sense that the ratios of the lengths cannot be too small okay so w1 bar is not going to be much smaller than w2 bar and so on okay any questions here okay so what i am going to do in the next two slides i am going to prove this translated statement okay that is you are given a lattice in an inner product space and it has a certain basis which approximates being an orthogonal basis okay the one way you can think of it is like this okay suppose you have the upper half plane okay in that you have fixed one zero as a orthogonal uh, as a as an orthonormal vector in a lattice where can the other vector be it could be anywhere okay but somehow it is saying that if you have a lattice which contains 1 comma 0 the other vector uh, another uh, like you know and another basis element can be chosen it to be in the standard fundamental domain that's what is this is roughly saying okay anyway let us st start doing it this what i have written over here is precisely a copy paste from the previous slide okay so that uh, you don't have to remember the full statement for now so given a lattice we want to choose a basis now what i am going to describe is how to choose a basis for the lattice okay so the first condition says is says that mm, w2 bar uh, uh w2 bar should not be much shorter than w1 bar okay so based on this idea and since w1 bar is the same as w1 the first thing to do is to choose w1 to be the shortest non zero uh, vector in the lattice l okay so it's some kind of greedy algorithm we want w1 to be as short as possible in a sense we want w2 next to be as short as possible and so on so you start off by taking w1 to be the shortest vector okay how do you choose w2 it is slightly more tricky because the condition 1 uh okay so so see we have to choose a basis which satisfies both conditions 1 and 2 let me not bother about condition 2 because uh, i am kind of running out of time but it's an easy exercise okay it's just gram schmidt orthogonalization you can always change the wi by a linear combination of the previous w js and therefore uh, like you know that doesn't change the assertion 1 so i'll only show how to satisfy assertion 1 okay so how are you going to choose w2 notice that assertion 1 does not depend on wi and wi plus 1 it only depends on w bar i and w bar i plus 1 okay so we don't want to minimize the length of w2 we want to minimize the length of w2 bar which is the by gram schmidt orthogonalization it is projection from of w2 onto the orthogonal complement of w1 okay and if you want to inductively argue this you will have to actually replace the lattice l by a lattice in this projection which is defined to be you take l which is a lattice in w and project l onto w1 perp okay sorry that was a bit fast but uh, this is roughly the idea okay so uh, you can check that this works so let me explain since this is inductive what i am going to do now is actually to deal with the case m equals 2 because it is inductive if you know the proof for m equals 2 you are going to be able to prove it for general m okay so inductively instead of proving this translated statement 
I am going to prove this simpler statement. Okay, so even if you did not follow this algorithm, just follow this inductive statement. We are going to prove that. Suppose you are given a vector space R M with some inner product, and you are given a lattice. Okay, you have chosen the smallest non-zero vector and called it W one. W two is not the next smallest vector, but W two is a vector such that if you do the Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization of W two, namely W two bar, which is the projection of W two to the orthogonal complement of W one. Okay, any such vector W two bar, in particular the shortest W two bars, which sat uh, which satisfies that, is going to satisfy. That W two bar is at least a or root three over two times the length of W one. Okay, so this is the assertion that you want. So this is the statement about just two vectors in a lattice where one of them is the shortest. Okay, it's enough to prove this. Okay, so I have just re reproduced the previous uh, the last part of the previous slide here so that you don't have to remember it. Okay, uh, but now. You see, we only have two vectors, right? So we can restrict ourselves to the span of those two vectors and the spanned lattice, and therefore we can actually assume that our original vector space was simply two-dimensional, and therefore you can assume that your uh, vector space W was R two or C, and that the inner product was the standard inner product. Okay, and moreover, the lattice L. Inside C, we don't know what that lattice is, but we can rotate and scale that lattice. That is not going to change the ratio between W two bar and W one bar. Therefore, by rotating and scaling the lattice, you can assume that the first vector is one comma zero, as shown in this picture. Okay, so now you have a lattice inside complex numbers with the usual inner product, and W one is simply the vector one comma zero, and you are going to Start with some other vector w two in the lattice with some property. Okay, what you are given is that w one is the shortest vector in the lattice. That is, any other non-zero vector is at least going to be on the unit circle or outside it. Okay, so w two could be anywhere else in the complex plane with respect to this condition, but you can always replace it with its negative and assume that w two is actually in the upper half plane. Okay, so w two is x plus i y with y greater than zero. Okay. And then W two bar is not going to change if you replace W two with W two plus some integral multiple of W one. And what that means is that you can assume that W two is of the form x plus i y, where not only is y greater than zero, but also x coordinate is between minus half and half, right? Because W one is one comma zero, so you can add a multiple of one comma zero and make the x coordinate between minus half and half. Okay. In other words. W two actually lands inside the earlier coarse fundamental domain that I mentioned. Okay, and if you look at just look at this picture, it follows that the length of uh, sorry, this is a typo. It should have been W two bar and not W two. Okay, W two bar, which is the same as uh, the same y, right? Because W two is now projection onto the orthogonal complement, which is just uh, the reading of the y coordinate, which is at least root three over two. Okay. So sorry, I that proof was slightly technical. I went over it slightly fast, but the point is uh, this part of the proof is actually slightly because it is slightly weird. Uh, maybe we can think of it as number theory, whereas the proof of Vivasava decomposition was group theory. Okay, so this is actually a genuinely non-trivial idea and slightly tricky one. Uh, but I'll share you the slides and I recommend that you look at the slides because I might go through this argument in the Adelic setting in the third lecture. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Let me move ahead. So let me just discuss the definition of A B reduced basis again. Let A be at most root three over two and B be at most half. We just sketched a proof of the following statement. Okay. Even if you did not understand the proof, please focus on the statement. You have an m-dimensional vector space W with this inner product. The statement is that any lattice L contained in W has a basis W one up to W m that has this property, which we are calling A B reduced. Namely, the basis is not an orthonormal basis, but it doesn't 
fail too much from being orthonormal in the following sense. First, do the orthogonalization W1 bar up to Wm bar with the Gram Schmidt orthogonalization. Then each W bar i plus 1 is at least 8 times W bar i. Okay, so the orthogonal basis lengths, the vectors lengths are not going to increase too much. They are roughly of the same size, except that W1 bar is allowed to be really short. Okay, and second statement is actually saying that uh, the Gram Schmidt orthogonalization does not involve uh, uh, like you know linear combinations with uh, non-trivial absolute values more than half or b. Okay, so again the first condition is like the y coordinate being at least root three over two. Second condition is like x coordinate between minus half and half. Okay, so this condition is saying that the ordered basis w one up to w m fails by at most the pair a comma b from being orthonormal. Okay, so now let me just put it together and just summarize what we have done in the proof of the key lemma. Okay, we had an element G in SLM of R. We want to modify it by an element of SLM of Z and show that that modified element had an Iwasawa decomposition of a certain property. Okay, so what do we do? Let WM bar, WM prime up to WN prime be the basis that encodes G. Okay. So G takes E1 up to EM up to E1 to WM prime up to W1 prime. Okay. Now, how do we encode gamma times an, some element of SLM Z times G? Okay. It turns out that by picking out another basis, which spans the same lattice as WM prime up to W1 prime. Okay. So again, we are encoding elements of GLM of R by various bases for the vector space. And the point is that two elements differ by an element of SLM of Z if and only if they span the same basis. Okay. Um, so choose an AB reduced basis W1 up to WM of L. That means that WM up to W1, uh, uh, you know, you can write WM prime up to W1 prime in terms of integral linear combinations of WM up to W1. So in other words, there is gamma in GLM of Z such that this condition is satisfied and uh, uh, okay, so actually you can choose gamma to be the SLM of Z. I did not, there's a little bit of an argument there which I skipped. But anyway, if you now go through everything that we have done, G takes EM trans e, EM up to E1 to WM prime up to W1 prime, which is gamma times WM up to W1. And then the proof of Iwasawa decomposition gives you the NAK. And if you go through the details, the condition of AB reduced actually tells you that uh, the uh, AA by AA plus one, each of them is at least A, that is the A part of the AB reduced. And the B part of the AB reduced tells you that the upper triangular entries are all going to be at most B. Okay. So this is roughly the idea of the theorem of getting a coarse fundamental domain for SLMR over SLMZ. These are elements which uh, whose Iwasawa decomposition has a certain constraint on N and a certain constraint of A. Okay, so now a slight restatement of the key lemma, but for SLM, okay, so I have confused SLM and GLM a little bit in some of the previous slides. Those will have to be corrected. Okay, so I'm just restating it. There is nothing more except, except in the last particular statement. So for some A, which is at most root 3 over 2, and some B, which is at most half, consider the set of all G in SLM of R which satisfies this condition with respect to the Iwasawa decomposition. The first condition is on N, reminiscent of absolute value of X less than or equal to half. Second condition is on A, reminiscent is of absolute value of Y, uh, Y being at least root 3 over 2. Okay. The condition is that if you choose this FAB, then SLM of Z times FAB is SLM of R. Okay. This is exactly what we proved for GLM in the previous slide. Okay, except that for SLM, you have to actually take care of the determinant condition, which I have not addressed. But the second thing is that, as Devendra they asked, this FAB is actually a coarse fundamental domain. Can you still prove things with it? Yes, if you prove this much, that can actually prove to you that SLM of R mod SLMZ has finite volume. Okay, so since I don't, I'm running out of time, I'm not going to spend much time on the proof. Anyway, uh, I'm only going to 
uh, discuss the proof for SL2 of R. Okay. The general M, the case of general M is similar. Only difference is that there will be more uh, variables. Okay. But this captures the entire idea. So if you see, remember G itself can be diffeomorphically written as N cross A cross K. So with respect to decomposing G as N cross A cross K, it so turns out that the Haar measure on G also decomposes. Okay. Roughly speaking, the idea is that N times A is actually the group A group B and that whatever crazy thing I have written here, a Haar measure on N dN times a Haar measure on A, which is dA1 over A1 times a correction factor A2 over A1 captures a Haar measure on the B part and the dK is a Haar measure on K. So if you do this, you are actually getting a B cross K invariant where B acts from the left and K acts from the right on SL2 of R. And since BK is SL2 of R, that's actually, you can show that it's SL2 of R invariant. Okay. So basically the rough idea is that a Haar measure on SL2 of R can be expressed in terms of DN, DA and DK. And the combination from DA is actually of the form DA by A cube. Okay. So that's the take home message. I'm not explaining more because I'm running out of time. Okay. And instead of integrating on SLM of R modulo SLM of Z, it's enough to integrate on this set FAB. Okay. So if you look at FAB, there is a condition on N, which actually says that its matrix entries cannot be too large. So the condition on N is some kind of a compact condition. And the condition on A is actually that A has to be at least root three over two, or, uh, you know, it has to be at least, uh, you know, uh, yeah, let's, let's take A equal to root three over two. So the integral on the A part that you have, you get, is integral root a to infinity a1 raised to minus 3 d a1. Okay. So that you can check is a is less than infinity. Okay. So why do you get a1 raised to minus 3 here? Because y was like a1 squared. So a1 to the minus 3 d a1 is like dy by y squared, and you have dx dy by y squared on the upper half plane. Okay. Sorry, that was a bit quick, but the point is that once you have the rough fundamental domain, uh, then you can actually uh, show that the volume is finite. Okay, so here are some results that we are not going to prove for now. This says that although FAB is not a fundamental domain, it is kind of like a fundamental domain in that it translates, some of its translates may intersect it, but only finitely many translates of that fundamental domain are going to intersect it. Okay. So, uh, set of all elements in SLM of Z such that uh, gamma says that gamma times the coarse fundamental domain intersects the coarse fundamental domain is finite. So it's, it goes some way up to being a fundamental domain. So unfortunately, I cannot uh, describe the discuss the proof now. I'm running out of time. The point is that if you have two reduced bases of the same lattice, since they are not far away from being orthonormal, the matrices that take them to each other cannot be far away from being orthogonal. So in some sense, you can take one to the other by compact and compact intersection discrete is finite. I mean, I'm being very sloppy there. Okay. And once you do this, you can use this to prove that SLM of Z is finitely generated as a group. In fact, you can actually show that those elements in SLM of Z, which take the fundamental domain to something which intersects with the fundamental domain generates SLM of Z. Okay. Although the finite generation of SLM of Z itself can be proved elementarily, the point is that this proof generalizes and you, this allows you to prove by borel harishchandra theory that many more groups are finitely generated. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead. We'll hopefully see a little bit if we, if time permits. And this is how the whole proof works for SL2 of Z. Okay. If you, the fundamental domain is E times itself and you have these two generators T and S for SL2 of Z. T simply right translates by one okay. unit. S simply uh, is a minus one by Z bar. And you can show, see that any, every neighbor of your fundamental domain is actually obtained from the fundamental domain by S or T. Therefore, these generate SL2 of Z. Okay. Sorry, I'm being very quick there. Okay. So this FAB, the set of all elements with certain NAK decomposition, where A satisfies some condition analogous to root uh, Y coordinate being greater than root three over two, and N being in some fixed compact set, that is what is known as a Siegel set. Okay. So Borel Harishchandra generalized this construction to higher groups, and those are going to be rough fundamental domains. Okay. So uh, 
I was thinking of discussing, I was hoping to discuss Mahler compactness, but I think I will not get time to discuss this. So Devendra, what do you think? Should I take five minutes and discuss this or should I discuss this next time? Sure, you can discuss today and maybe remind uh, next day also a bit of it. Okay. Uh, so this is going to take uh, five minutes roughly. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Um, so it's easy to prove that SLM of uh, GLM of R mod GLM of Z and SLM of R mod SLM of Z are not compact. But we would like to do something more. We would like to describe which subsets of these quotients are relatively compact. Okay. The reason is that suppose you want to study whether SOM of R modulo gamma is compact. We want to study by studying the image of that in SLM of R mod SLM of Z. So we want to study other groups by embedding them inside SLM or GLM. Okay. So that is why we want a criterion for this. Okay. So this is a theorem which says when a certain subset of SLM of R mod SLM of Z is compact. Remember that it is a space of unimodular lattices. So you can think of this quotient as the space of unimodular lattices L contained in RM. Okay. So it says that a subset psi inside this space of lattices is relatively compact if and only if something simple happens. Okay. What is that? The simple thing is that for some positive real number delta, it has to be contained in a set of the form S of delta. What is that? So remember, I'm thinking of this as the space of lattices. So S of delta is the subspace of lattices such that every non-zero vector in that lattice has length at least delta. Okay. So in other words, a certain subspace of the space of lattices is relatively compact, that is, has compact closure, if and only if every non-zero vector in every one of them has size at least some delta. Okay. So the size of non-zero vectors in all those lattices is bounded below. Okay. So the necessity is actually easy to prove. Given a lattice, you can map it to the size of the smallest vector and you can show that it's a continuous function and a continuous function on a compact set has to be bounded in R star, compact inside R star and hence has to avoid some positive uh, neighborhood of zero. But this remarkable condition is saying that the converse is also true. Namely, if a bunch of lattices avoids a ball near zero, then that set is relatively compact. Okay. So let me give an idea of the proof. Suppose, uh, so we, what we need to show is that S of delta is relatively compact. Okay. Set of all lattices which avoid the delta ball near zero. Okay. For that, it is enough to prove the following show that there exists a positive real number C such that any of these lattices has some basis W1 up to Wm whose sizes are bounded above. Why is this enough? Because you can reach any of these bases from the standard basis by some matrix with bounded coefficients and therefore some compact subset of matrices is going to take your standard basis to some basis of your lattice. Okay. So the idea is to show that any lattice L with this property, which avoids a ball around zero, has a basis with bounded uh, lengths of for its vectors. Okay. So obviously no points for guessing that the basis that we are going to choose is W1 up to WM and AB reduced base. Okay. What is the idea? You see the statement of the theorem even looks a bit counterintuitive, right? Because what is given See, we want a basis whose sizes are bounded above, whereas what we are given is the is a base is that uh, the lattice uh, elements have length which are bounded below. Okay, so the idea is that if W one up to W m were an orthogonal basis, then these bases, you know, because your lattice is new unimodular, the product of lengths of W one up to W m would be equal to one. So if you are if all of the lengths are bounded below, then all of the lengths are also bounded above because it's a, you know, product is one. This would have been true if you had an orthogonal basis, but in general, you don't have an orthogonal basis. You only have an approximately orthogonal basis an AB reduced basis. And the point is that that is enough to still preserve the compactness. Okay. So let me not describe more here. 
Okay, so this is just a restatement of whatever I stated stated here. So thus, in unimodular lattices, relatively compact just means avoids a ball around zero. A similar statement holds true for GLM. One has to instead of S of delta, you need to impose the condition of not only avoiding a delta ball around zero, but also the co-volume of these lattices all being bounded above. Okay, and here is another way of stating the same statement, namely. Um, mm, uh, actually, this is not the form in which I wanted to actually say, uh, uh, so actually, you know, let me not get into this. Let me actually get back to this next time around. Okay. So the point is that you, so I have given you a condition for relative compactness in terms of avoiding a ball. That same condition can be given in a sequentially compact fashion, which is what is actually going to be helpful for us in our applications. Okay, so it's actually going to say that a subset M of SLMR mod SLM of Z is relatively compact if and only if uh, 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 Well, I, yeah, I, I think this is actually fine, but uh, let me come to this next time because you know, it's actually, I'm rushing at the end and rushing at the end is not a good idea. So let me stop there. Okay. So it's actually a simple translation using metric spaces into of the earlier statement. Okay. So yeah, let me stop there. Okay. Thank you, Professor Verma, for a nice talk. Thank you. Any questions out there? Anybody wants to give any comments or questions? Most welcome. Large part of your talk was based on that fundamental domain. Yes, it using used its properties. Yeah, in a sense, it used the so that's a good question. It used properties of the fundamental domain in the following sense. I use that every lattice L has an AB reduced basis basis, right? Hmm. Right. So that statement is equivalent to the construction of the fundamental domain because that was what was used to construct the fundamental domain. So my question is, that there are multiple fundamental domain associated to a particular group, even the SL to Z. Yeah. So if we start with a different fundamental domain, we will have similar things. Uh, I mean, see, are, are that fundamental domain has something special mode. So this is a particular kind of construction of the fundamental domain. Okay. You could repeat this construction with other choices. You see, I chose an N, I chose an A, I chose a K, right? Hmm. There are other choices of N, K, A and K. If you repeat them, you will get similar things, but uh, if you construct in a completely different way, then I don't know. I mean, there are nicer fundamental domain for the in some sense nicer than the you the one you used here. So uh, we will get a better result or what? So I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Actually, initially you have shown some uh Haldum computations like pi square upon six and so on. So. Uh, this finiteness of volume is proved in the theorems, uh, but are there volume computations in general later on people try to find out volumes and so on? Uh, so it has been found out in uh, many of the standard cases, right? For SLMR of SLM of R mod SLMZ, Ziegel had the Ziegel had a formula which generalizes exactly this. Instead of uh, pi square by six, which was zeta of two, you get zeta of two, zeta of three up to zeta of m. Okay. Now for more general groups, uh, where uh, you know one has to actually worry about what is the analog of SLM of Z, but then there are various volume formulas. There is the theory of Tamagawa numbers, and uh, probably there is the work of Gopal Prasad and so on. So there is a lot of work, but I haven't followed all that work. But yeah. the thing is, uh, one of the issues is that uh, one has to sp specify the choice of the volume very carefully, and that's the theory of the Tamagawa measure. And uh, then one has to also. Uh, study what are the various subgroups that we want to consider and uh, in terms of them, uh, you know, what are the different ways in which we can express things? I mean, you know, so it's actually a very, very nice and beautiful theory. Just like zeta of two uh, fact has an Euler uh, factorization into local factors. There also uh, you have local measures and you can relate global measures to local measures by some L values and so on. So it's actually a very fascinating and beautiful theory. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. So one consequence of 
the course fundamental domain will be that volume of slmr mod slm is finite uh -huh. uh, but uh, but that itself will not so so that itself will give us a bound right on yeah the volume yeah that will not be enough to compute the precise volume so zegel's work uh, has yeah, yeah. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. Maybe send the slides soon so 